Hey everyone. Hello, David. Hello, Peter. Hey, Ryan. How are you? Good to see you. Fantastic. Hi. Uh, so hi, we we had about almost two thousand people register for this, and we're using a new platform. So we're going live on on YouTube, Facebook, uh, a few different uh, platforms. So um, you know, hopefully everything goes smoothly. If not. All good. It's uh, it's a cool platform to be using, uh, Streamyard. So we could jump into it just because we're um, we're recording this and we're going to send out a recording to anyone. And today's a, a lovely day and everyone's able to do normal things again. So for the most part, so we'll we'll jump into it and try to keep it around an hour. Um, and uh, so go ahead, Steph. We'll quickly go through what to expect. So we'll go through some introductions and then we'll talk about what is an assignment on, you know, kind of a, a basic level, like, you know, what is it from an investor's perspective? Uh, Cause we are mainly talking about it from investors who are buying or selling assignments. Uh, we'll talk about the pros and cons of condo assignments. And then we'll look at it from David Feld, our lawyer, uh, our expert lawyer, uh, his uh, uh, lawyer's perspective of condo assignments. And then we'll hand it over to Peter Idri, my accountant, and uh, he'll give us the accountant's perspective on assignments, which is a really, really important uh, piece of doing this properly. Um, and then we'll look at some key takeaways and just kind of cover, you know, what the important points were of, of the discussion and presentation. And then we'll get into a QA. and a And I know there's a ton of questions because I've been getting them all week. So uh, let's try to get through this and then we'll get to the Q&A and hopefully answer everyone's questions. So myself, I'm Ryan Coyle. I'm a broker and co-founder of connect.ca Realty. I've been in real estate investing for 20 years now, a little over 20 years. Started investing in multi-residential units, fourplexes, fiveplexes in Brantford, Hamilton area, and um, bought my first condo probably about 16, 17 years ago at Bain Dundas and closed on it. And it was the easiest, simplest investment I'd ever made. Sold all of my other real estate, uh, that was almost a full-time job, and then continue to invest in pre-construction condos. Um, been a uh, real estate broker for 16 years, uh, founded several real estate-related companies, uh, Connect.ca, Marco Toronto, our property management division, One Day Money, which does some private lending. Um, my team, I have an amazing team, um, sales team, management team, and min team, marketing team, and we are one of the top teams in, in probably the country when it comes to, to pre-construction. And uh, I personally got a portfolio of... Um, it's, it's higher now, 60, uh, 36 doors, and uh, a value of just over $20 million. Uh, David, tell us about yourself. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, I'm David Feld. I'm a, a real estate lawyer and entrepreneur um, and real estate investor. Um, I actually, today we're talking about assignments. I know I don't want to steal the thunder of what we're talking about. I think everyone knows. And I learned about assignments from people like Ryan Coyle and they're his clients actually. So we'll get into that in a little bit, but assignments are incredible. Uh, yeah, so I'm a lawyer and with alongside my wife, Sonia Kaya, who's also on the call and may pipe in from time to time uh, and correct me <laughs> uh, and, and like she does at home, just kidding. And uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I buy property as well uh, with tenants, but lately I've been buying uh, properties and assigning them. And so that's kind of why we're all excited and passionate about assignments and why we're all kind of here today. So that's Yeah, I was holding off. To, to ask you that question because I remember we talked a few weeks ago and you mentioned you're doing some assignments so I was, I was looking forward to asking you about that once we uh, we get into it for sure yeah and you forgot to mention your your TikTok handle oh yeah well so I mean, this, guy, um, this guy's a big celebrity on TikTok <laughs> <laughs> he's got a uh, the David the Feld right there David the Feld yeah it's at David the Feld uh, some guy knocked on my door one day said I love your house what do you do for a living and somehow I started going viral on TikTok and Instagram from that so it's been a fun a fun ride for me and, we're still doing. I'm live on TikTok and Instagram right now as well, so that's pretty cool. And you learn a lot, of, and it's entertaining. So you guys should follow. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's mostly entertaining and less educational. I got it, <laughs> <laughs> but follow me. It's fun. Yeah, Peter. Okay, I'm Peter Edry. I'm the owner of Accounting Plus. Uh, we have been in the business for over thirty years. I uh, have a, gr a group of uh, excellent accountants. We have uh, 13 employees in the company. Eight of them are CPAs. Uh, at least three of them are specialized in uh, real estate. So anytime you have any question, I mean, you can just free, free to uh, contact us. Go ahead. 
I think I think it's really important to mention as well. So so David and I have been working together for years. He's been I've worked with a lot of lawyers and I've gone through a lot of lawyers and I've been working with David and Sonia and their team for I don't know probably ten years, close, many yeah. years anyway. And um, you know that's really what we're going to talk about on this presentation, but you know, really it's important to work with a team uh, of people who have done what you want to do. And, um, you know, and, and this is them. And, and Peter is my accountant who I haven't been working with as long as David, but I've been working with now for probably two or three years. And, and it's been a game changer for me. I uh, just going through the presentation, I, I learned even more just prepping for this. So, um, you know, it's really important to to have someone to find you the deal, someone to help you, you know, make sure the deal is a good deal, uh, has all the right conditions, clauses, you know, protects you. Uh, and then the person who's going to save you money at the end, right, who's uh, who's going to help you take it, uh, approach it from the right tax perspective. So I will, uh, I, I'm not the, the legal or tax expert here, and I know most of those questions are geared around that. So I'm, I'm going to fly through a few slides and then hand it over to my guests. And uh, just, you know, what on a high level is a condo assignment from an investor's perspective? And it's really investing in paper versus investing in a tangible real estate asset. So what does that mean? So buying pre-construction, and mainly I'm talking about pre-construction condos because I'll get into why that, in my opinion, is the best investment. Um, but you're, you're buying ideally at the first uh, sales cycle, the beginning of the sales cycle. When maybe there isn't even a presentation center yet. We get access, VIP access, platinum VIP access, whatever you want to call it. But the lowest possible pricing, uh, you're buying a piece of paper, you're putting that in your filing cabinet for the next three, four, five, six years, taking advantage of all of the appreciation of the market, and then you're assigning your interest in that contract to another person, company, or entity uh, at the ideal time. Um, we'll talk about the ideal time later, but um, that's kind of the, the gist of it. And there's three people involved in assignment, other than the people helping us with it, but three parties. There's the assignor, that's the, the investor, the original purchaser selling their interest in the contract. There's the assignee who is, is taking over their interest in the contract. You know, I don't want to simplify, but it's almost like just picture crossing out a name and adding a new name um, with a few other pages and paperwork. It's, it's kind of like that. Uh, David, you know, I'm just, <laughs> it's exactly like that. obviously a lot more involved, which yeah. David helps with. Um, and then there's the vendor who's the original seller, the developer in this, in this case. I use a lot of quotes. I, I love quotes. I use them to stay motivated, focused, inspired. And uh, this one uh, I really like. Robert Kiyosaki is a, a big real estate guru, investor, and speaker, and author. And um, this one is the power of leverage. So leverage is the reason why um, it is the reason some people become rich and others do not become rich. It's pretty uh, pretty simple, pretty straight to the point. Um, if you could take it to the next slide. So we'll go into the pros and cons of buying and selling and investing in assignments. And, you know, I think the biggest is that it's the ultimate leverage. You're, you're leveraging yourself on a highly appreciating piece of paper, essentially. Um, and, and you're not, um, and, and, and some of these deposits are also lower than if you were to buy, you know, an existing property that might need 10 or sorry, 20 plus percent down. So uh, you're getting the ultimate leverage by buying pre-construction this piece of paper um, but you're not actually taking out a mortgage so you know that means a number of things maybe you couldn't qualify for a mortgage maybe you could only qualify for one mortgage this gives you the ability to buy to get into real estate without uh, having to actually take out a mortgage and, and and I'll get into the cons like there's risks I'm not saying this is like the best thing for mm -hmm. everyone We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that and if and Peter David if you want to jump in feel free um, no closing costs. Um, you know, there's taxes, but you know, you avoid the heavy closing costs that pre-construction condos um, often have, and uh, the hassle and the headache and getting the mortgage and everything. And then there's staggered closing. So this is kind of uh, a thing that I like, and I learned this from one of my oldest and best clients. He was uh, who's a client of, of yours as well, David. Um, but they they were buying assignments for years and they kept selling or, or condos for years they kept selling I'm like why do you guys keep doing that you're leaving so much money on the table and you're getting hit with all of these taxes but they were actually doing it through their corporate entity 
um, which allowed them to defer the taxes considerably. And they just ended up having one or two condos staggered every year closing. And that gave them a really good extra revenue stream uh, from having, you know, the one or two every year. And they've got, you know, probably 15, 20 units closing over the next, you know, now five, six years. So, um, you know, it's, it gives you the ability to do more in real estate without the mortgage, with the ultimate leverage, no closing costs, staggering them. And then you can defer taxes within a corporate structure. So, you know, we'll get really in depth with this with Peter, but, um, you know, there's a right way and wrong way of doing it. And, and people talk about how they're not lucrative. It's not worth doing it. It's buying assignments and selling assignments. The taxes are too, too big, but uh, there's a way of doing it the right way and a way of doing it the wrong way. Um, the cons, it's, it's speculative. I mean, you know, real estate is speculative, but, you know, I think some people might buy maybe more than they can you know technically get qualified for which i has always been an opportunity for me but you have to be aware that you might need mortgage financing one day and you should always have plan b in mind meaning you have the ability to close if you need to in four or five years just to add one sentence to that you legally must close on it if you don't find someone to buy it so it's it's not just yeah <laughs> Which is never actually, I mean, I'm sure it's happened to you because you, you deal with way more deals, but I've, I've never personally had that happen to a client. Yet. It's very rare. And I can just say quickly, at least you get to keep the deposit that was made. So you want a hefty deposit on an assignment in case, God forbid, the assignee cannot close. At least you keep their deposit. Then, yes, it's a scramble to close. You close it and then you could either sell it or rent it out. So that's like a worst case scenario. You still, if it's happened, which is very rare, you, you I've seen everyone end up on top in most cases, but a little bit of a scramble. Yeah. Then there's the, uh, sorry, you can go back, Steph. I just got a few more points. Uh, Short-term gain versus long-term wealth creation. So I've always been a long-term thinker with real estate. It's always been like, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, that way you can ride out any up and down market. We know over the long term, you're, you're going to do extremely well in real estate. So I'm, you know, people might find this uh, shocking, but I'm actually a very conservative investor with my numbers, with, you know, my portfolio, with everything. And, you know, I've obviously done really well with that approach, but you know, uh, I actually now have the, the kind of two focuses as an investor is especially now I work with Peter and knowing that I'm able to defer taxes in a better way. But I now buy condos solely for assigning them because I'm creating that extra revenue stream, uh, whereas I used to always be like close, close, close. So, you know, I think you, you can make some short term gain, uh, but, you know, to really create wealth in real estate is a long term game. Uh, CRA and tax implications. So there, we're going to get into this, but there are CRA and tax implications you see with condo assignments that you don't necessarily see with resale. Um, and then selling assignments. Uh, they're tough. They, they don't, uh, often developers don't allow you to uh, advertise on MLS or there's conditions in the contract that state the building has to be 90% sold. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, if you're an investor also, I think it's important to know that the optimal time to sell an assignment is to be an investor selling to an end user at market price. Uh, if you sell early, you're often an investor selling to an investor and you might be leaving money on the table. So timing has a lot to do with it as well. Yeah, that's very true. Real estate to build wealth. If you don't find a way to make money while you sleep, you will work until you die. And that's from Warren Buffett, who I think everyone knows has done quite well with investing. <laughs> Um, so that leads me into why pre-construction condos, uh, it'll perform, performs other real estate without actually owning the real estate. <laughs> That's crazy to me. Um, you know, you could buy a REIT, you could buy a, a stock that maybe focuses on real estate, but it's very difficult to get leverage uh, margin. Um, it's very risky. Um, but here in pre-construction, especially, you know, the pre-construction phase, you get the ultimate leverage without even needing a mortgage. Um, by the time you take out a mortgage or a sign in this uh, this example, um, you've, uh, you've you've you know had huge amounts of appreciation, and um, these are just some really interesting numbers that were made available recently by Urban Nation and Trev um, to put this in perspective. And so the GTA pre-construction five-year average. So this is GTA Greater Toronto Area is thirteen percent pre-construction versus 11.26% detached homes, which everyone seems to think is, you know, always outperforming, um, which it is on the resale market. And then you've got 7.11% for existing condos. That's the five-year average. Uh, the downtown pre-construction 
five-year average is 15% versus 11.4% detached homes and 6.51% for existing condos. Now, the 45-year average is 6.66%. That's actually up higher now, so I haven't done this math and I'm probably a year and a half. I think it's probably closer to seven. Um, so, you know, that 45 year had lots of, uh, lots of ups and downs, but the long-term average, and if you're, you, you're, you're putting together financial pro formas, uh, I think David just left us, uh, Steph, if you could let him back in. Um, so if you look at the long-term average, which is like really, you know, telling, uh, there's been ups and downs and you've still got a, a close to a 7% compounded annual growth rate in Toronto real estate. Now, it helps you create passive income and multiple revenue streams. And for me, like investing in real estate, investing in anything has always been create more revenue streams, create more revenue streams. Even if you have a lot of little performing revenue streams, you're going to do really well than one high performing one. So I like to create multiple revenue streams and you could do that very easily through real estate. Every property is its own revenue stream. And, um, you know, it helps create the, the passive income, income while you'll sleep. And, I think to put it in, in further perspective, why Toronto condos or, or, or in real estate in general are such a good investment is last year, the average Canadian salary was $54,640. The average GTA condo price uh, recently was $624,000. Okay, so if you add 13%, you know, the average five year average, um, that's $81,000 in appreciation which is essentially equity which is essentially you know goes in your pocket one day so you know you have two or three of those and and, and you can do the math it's it's a very good way of building very passive wealth um and, and in, a, in a very uh, positive way uh, easy hands free way i was trying to say to build wealth uh, and, and on that note you know we talked about the investing i'm going to hand over to david um you know this is all from the lawyer's perspective and you can jump right in Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, David again here. Um, there's my information. I'm going to share my screen right now. And by the way, you can always reach out to my firm, info at wearelaw.ca, or you can literally reach out to me on Instagram or uh, TikTok or anywhere. <laughs> I'll share my screen. I'm sharing it right now, and hopefully it will show up for you. Is it showing up for everybody? Yeah, you can see okay. it. So I want to talk hello. practically. Sorry, is everything good? Yeah, I was just saying hello to Sonia. Just popped okay. up. Good. Okay. And so and everyone feel free to jump in and ask questions as we go. So listen, when you buy new construction and everyone here is thinking of doing an assignment. So when you buy new construction, there's really just three things you can do. The first thing is you could live there as your primary place of residence. The second thing is you could rent it out. And the third thing is you could assign it. We have to understand a little bit about new construction to understand what the assignment would do. So I'm just going to take you through that quickly and then we'll shift right into assignments. So imagine Jane and John Doe, and I'm taking right into a spreadsheet that we use with our clients so you can see practically how everything works. So imagine Jane and John Doe bought a property at 65 Broadway Avenue, and the purchase price, and we'll get right into it, was 550,000. Now in general, you give 20% in deposit, so they'd give 5,000 with the offer, which is very normal. Then they give 22,000, 27,000, 27,000. And then on occupancy, because there's two closings with new construction, they would give their last 27,000 adding up to 20%. Now, normally, um, assignments are done before that last occupancy. So normally, if you add these up, they would actually only have paid, it's at the bottom right here, $82,500 as their deposit. That, that's the actually a really cool point as well, because, and I kind of touched on it earlier, like, you know, if you're buying a resale condo, you're putting down 20%, if you're an investor. Um, if you're buying pre-construction, you're often getting deposits with, you know, 10% down before occupancy. And that's it. That's actually quite a common deposit structure right now. So, you know, you, you kind of double your returns when you factor in that you're only putting down 10% versus 20%. Exactly. So we're starting to see incentives from builders that are not at the 20% mark. And I'll show you 20% here on the right. But actually... 20% here, and they receive 10%. Sometimes we've even seen five. And so, as you know, if you want to do an assignment and you get a low deposit structure, that's a very good thing, right? Because you're putting out very little money and you're making quite a bit back. So that's great. Sometimes, and we'll get into it, they'll make you bring your deposits up to 20% to allow you to do the assignment, mind you. But we'll talk about that. Okay. So imagine you did that. And I want to just say a couple of other things quickly because I want to show you that when you do an assignment, you don't have to worry about these things. So, one thing is add occupancy, and this is another thing. If you were not going to do an assignment, but you were either going to live there or rent it out, you would have to pay a monthly occupancy fee or rent, usually for three to six months. 
in the amount of approximately, in this case, $1,900. And during that time, if you assign this, you won't have to pay this. It would be the other person, the assignee, who has to pay it. So there's savings right there as well. Uh, and that's one thing. And another thing, just quickly, if you're not going to live there, but you're going to rent it out, many of you know this, but you have to pay an additional $24,000 as an HST rebate. And I know we'll get into this more with the accountant on closing to close. So where closing costs for someone would be 44,000 to close in this case, which represents 8% of the purchase price, they would have to pay another 24,000 if they were renting this out, bringing their total to 68,000. Now, granted, they could get that money back if they were going to rent it out, uh, they would get the 24,000 back. However, you can avoid all of these things. So what I want to get to, what my point is in all this, you can avoid paying this 24,000 and having to get it back. You can avoid paying this 44,000 in closing costs if you want to do an assignment. So that's why we're seeing, okay, go ahead. Did someone want to say something? No, I think that was uh, maybe one of the messages may it be. Okay. So you would, you would, if you want to assign it, you can skip all that. So let's, let's look at assignments for a minute. What is an assignment? So an assignment is, as you said, and I'll just sort of rephrase it, is taking this contract that you signed with a builder maybe a couple of years ago and selling that to someone else, hopefully for profit. Okay. And we're going to use a real example here as we talk. And then I'll let the accountant uh, today talk to us about taxes and all that, because I know that's the most important part of all this. Okay. So, and when you want to assign, you have to usually get consent from the builder. And at the very beginning, in the first 10 day cooling off period, you want to get a good lawyer to negotiate for you uh, that section, actually. So there's a whole assignment section in every single agreement of purchase and sale. And typically, it's basically saying um, if you can assign and how much they'll charge and what are the what are the conditions. Okay, And it's on a spectrum, just like everything else. It's on a spectrum. Spectrum ranges typically from around five hundred dollars a fee for you to assign at one time fee all the way up to, believe it or not, $25,000 to assign it. We've seen it all. Yeah. What's typical is $500 to $2,000. That's kind of the most sweet spot, typical uh, amount we see that a builder- I've been involved with deals where um, I was representing the assignee, someone finding an assignment and the, the, the seller just walked in from off the street to buy a, a condo and they didn't know to get any of these amendments done, didn't take it to a lawyer. Yeah. And the assignment fee was $25,000. It killed the deal. Exactly. You need a good lawyer and sort of driving this fact home. You need a good lawyer, not at the time you want to assign. You definitely need a good lawyer then because assignments are hard and you need a good lawyer. But you need a good lawyer at the very beginning when you're signing with the builder during the 10-day cooling off period to talk to you about your assignment rights in this particular agreement. Now, I know Ryan vets these and often, you know, it's very important because he knows that the uh, investors are going to want to assign. So he looks at that. But you need a lawyer to have a face-to-face -face talk with you. It's now live on <laughs> here. But... Uh, about the assignment clause. So let's look, let, let's look at this one, for example, okay? So this one says for only 847.50, one-time fee, it's not bad, as long as they've sold 90% of the units. So think about that. If there's like 100 units in a building, they have to have sold 90. If they've sold 90, then yes, you can sell it, but you're not allowed to list it on MLS. And that's almost across the board. You're not allowed to list it on MLS. And, and that, scares, that scares people away. That 90%, they're like, they, if they want bought because they want to assign, that 90% is going to get hit if you're buying in a good building to begin with. Um, and and, and that time to assign is, is closer to occupancy because you want to sell for market value. So you want the building to be a 90% sold anyway. So exactly. it's not a big deal. Exactly. By the time you want to sell, which isn't in the first, some people say, hey, can I sign it right away? I'm like, no, it's not worth more. You know, the day you sign an agreement, that's what it's worth. But the value, hopefully, in Toronto anyway, keeps going up. And if it's three, four years, you know, out before the closing. So in the third year, maybe, a, and I, you can tell me about timing better, but around uh, three, four months before the interim closing, that's when, of course, they've usually sold 90% by then. They would have sold it a long time ago. So you're okay. Yeah. So you cannot list it on MLS. And that scares people away too, because how are you supposed to find a buyer? And the truth is, you're not really allowed to list it anywhere. And you're not even allowed to say the word list or post. But I'll tell you this. There are places, I'm gonna use very careful words as a lawyer should, right? There are places that people put things on social media, places like Facebook and a lot of other places where a lot of eyes are all across Canada and the world are seeing it and there's no shortage of offers coming in on uh, assignments every single day, okay? So I also wanna point out and, and you know, it is my webinar, so I'm gonna make a plug. I might make a few of them, but sure. we have a database of over 100,000 investors 
Um, I've been doing assignments for 15 years. Uh, it used to be very niche, so there weren't a lot of agents that did them. There still aren't a lot, but we have a network of some of the top brokers that we all know where to go to find off-market listings, um, which has been the way we're able to do it. And we also actually have a full-time employee uh, overseas who's constantly posting our exclusive listings, so we're number one on Kijiji, number one on uh, you know whatever all the other ones are. Um, so yeah, there's there's ways of doing it. You don't need MLS. Uh, but sometimes they allow it, and that's obviously better. Exactly. So, so that's that's the important thing. Eight, and here they charge eight forty seven. It could be anywhere up to two thousand dollars. Very standard. If you want to assign to a relation, again, uh, here you're probably doing this in the name of a corporation, which we'll talk about in a minute. But if you want to assign to a relation, it's usually less expensive, like two hundred eighty two bucks. Not a problem. Okay. So assignments are trending, uh, for lack of a better term, right now, and we're seeing a lot of them come through our office for the same reasons that Ryan said. You're not because you're not paying all of these closing costs. And another important plus that you, uh, I don't know if you mentioned it, sorry if you did, is you don't have to deal with tenants. So, and I think that's why they're trending right now because the rental market in Toronto stinks. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's be honest with the pandemic, everyone laughed, but I mean, things are obviously going up and they're about to go up a lot. But I think that's why I personally feel like I've seen a lot of assignments is people don't want to deal with having to rent it out. That's right. So we're seeing a big trend in that. And I've watched a lot of my clients doing it over the years and I started doing it too. So instead of buying and putting tenants in, which I have a few properties here and there, I now buy to assign as well. Um, I've been doing that just again to reduce on my, uh, you know, I just put somebody out, let it sit. It's better than, you know, putting it in the bank or putting it, you know, even in stocks in many cases for me. And, and it's protects me from my own money. Cause sometimes I like to buy a few nice things, uh, <laughs> um, as some of you know, and uh, yeah, so, but it allows you to put some money out, wait a few years, and then you get some, a really good return. I, and we're gonna, we'll get, we'll talk about the taxes, but we'll have that uh, very, very soon in a few minutes. Okay, so if you do an assignment, you get to avoid the leasing part, you get to avoid paying all these closing costs, uh, you get to avoid paying this monthly occupancy fee, which is just money uh, out, out, out the door. So they're very good. Another important thing is you really want to make sure you have a good lawyer at the beginning because they some caps are not transferable. And what I mean by that is in this case, development charges were $14,500 and they're not transferable. So when you assign this to someone else, Mr. X, um, it may be that they won't pay uh, $14,500. They may pay $20,000 in closing costs. So you really want to make sure that you get it. If you're going into a property and, you're, and you know the reason why you're buying it is to assign it, then make sure you have a good lawyer at the beginning who tries to get you transferable caps and tries to make this agreement because that's what you're selling the most valuable thing possible. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, great. Another important thing is you don't pay land transfer taxes, right? That's that's part of the 44,000, but you don't pay land transfer taxes when you do this. And here's another tidbit that most people don't know, a, a really good one. If you're a first time home buyer and you buy a property and you sell it by assignment, then you never owned a property, you're still a first time home buyer. The next property you buy, you could still use your first time home buyer rebate because you've never owned a property. Good point. So a lot of people are liking that, okay? So yeah, I, I know some people who buy them to their children. <laughs> What's that? They, they, they put them in their children's names that way and then they, they'll, they'll sign it and they don't have to worry about that. Exactly. Okay, so we've covered a lot about assignments here. And of course, if anyone has questions anytime, they can always reach out to us. And I have an amazing team of people and we're all trained on assignments uh, to help you out and to help with strategy and things like that. Um, I also wanted to mention, we talked about this at the beginning, but if for some reason, Mr. X doesn't complete on the transaction, then in our case, Jane and John Doe are responsible to close. They're the ones who signed an agreement with the, purchase, with the uh, builder and they must complete if they can't assign. So we kind of talked about this at the beginning, but I'll just repeat. If that happens, and it is very rare. I mean, I do this every day. We do thousands of closings a year, and I, I don't even know of one example where an assignment didn't happen. There's been ups and downs and roller coaster rides and things like that, delays, but it always seems to close. Because, one, and this is advice, make sure you get a good deposit from the purchaser. And typically, it'll match your original deposit, uh, and we'll talk about that. Uh, well, we won't talk about it, but uh, the uh, the accountant will mention how HST works and all that. Um, but try and get the biggest deposit you can. So if, God forbid, Mr. X cannot complete on the transaction, then when John Doe and Jane Doe have to, and it's usually last minute if it would happen, um, they would have all of that deposit to keep because they would get to keep all that. 
And that would soften the blow. They can close, get a mortgage, and then they could decide to sell it right away or rent it out. Okay, so there, it's not even that bad in that case, but you do have to be ready. Because I have clients, for instance, uh, who are doing 20 to 50 per year of these. If they couldn't, if, they're, if a bunch of their purchasers can't close, they're gonna have to come up with millions and millions and millions of dollars in close. So it's, it becomes risky when you're doing a bunch of them. But I do have people getting into it. I'm getting into it myself big time. And kind of that's, that's what I'm doing as well. Like Ryan, him and I are basically buying and, and selling by assignment. Um, okay. Any questions so far? So many questions. So many. <laughs> you want to start asking me out of them for the end. It's all good. Um, okay. There is one that I, I've seen consistently, and, and I know I get all the time. I don't know if David or Peter want to answer it, but it's um, regarding HST um, included in the purchase price. So I don't know, David. Do you want to take a yeah. yeah. So everyone asks this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say it as cleanly as I can one time. And Sonia, you can correct me, or you can make it cleaner if you want. So. Here's how it works. When you buy a new construction property, HST is included in the purchase price period, okay? It is included. So for instance, if you're buying a $500,000 property, it includes HST, okay? 500,000, including HST. Now, what people don't understand is there's an HST rebate, which is separate from HST, okay? And they always mix it up. Most realtors mix this up. So I, I want realtors to get this right. There's HST, which is included in the purchase price period, and then there's an HST rebate, which we'll discuss right now. So here's how the HST rebate works. If you're going to live in this- Are property, you trying to use your uh, spreadsheet right now? No, no. no? Just, okay, got yeah. it. If you're going to live in this property as your primary place of residence on closing, you or a blood relative, like a mother, father, brother, or sister only, not even a cousin, which is weird. Um, if you're going to live there as your primary place of residence, then the HST rebate of approximately $24,000 is included in the purchase price. You don't have to pay it. So you're still paying $500,000. That's how that works. Right. Period. Simple. Now, let's flip it. If you're not going to live there as your primary place of residence because you're going to rent it out, then you do not get the HST rebate, which is around $24,000. So you have to pay it. So you pay an additional $24,000 to close. So on the $500,000 example we gave, you would pay $524,000 to close, which is $24,000 more. It sounds bad, but there's good news at the end. There's light at the end of the tunnel because if you're going to rent it out, you can do a rental housing rebate and get back $24,000. It's a check written to you from the CRA every time as long as you have a one-year lease. It has to be a one-year lease or more, but not less with a person, not a corporation. So John Smith, not one, two, three, ABC corporation. Now one question that always comes up right now is, can the landlord be a corporation? And the answer is yes, so long as that's the name on the deed. It has to match the name on the deed. We're, we're gonna, we're so getting close to segueing to Peter here. Uh, so it's, I hope Peter, you're excited and ready. It's yeah, like, that's, that's an important point. So just to clarify, the tenant can't be a corporation. Correct. The tenant must be a person, a John Smith. It's very important. Okay. And the landlord can be, but it just has to match title. That's very exactly. important. I know there's been issues. Um, and that's, again, why it's important to work with a good, you know, either sometimes lawyers do it, sometimes accountants do it, uh, the right team to do it the right way. Because you got to do it the right way. This is yeah, important because... A lot of money. Sorry, go ahead. Well, it's just a lot of money, right? It's no 24000 exactly. It's a $24,000 question. We have to get it right. Okay. It has to be right. So if everything goes right, which in 99.9% .9 of cases it does, because you're the tenant, whoever you are on, on the deed, and in many cases in, for people here today, it would be a corporation. Uh, and then John Smith, the, the person is the tenant. We then apply for a rental housing rebate for each client, and we get a check for 24,000, four months it takes from the date of final closing. So you, you are out $24,000 for four months, and you get it back, okay? I'm being, I'm giving an exact number of 24,000 because most properties these days are over 450,000. So that's the number. For properties under 450,000, the numbers change ever so slightly, but we're not dealing with much of that anymore. Typically, we're seeing properties over 450 now. But, right. so I won't get into that minutia. But long story short, just to repeat all that, HST is included in the purchase price, end of story. The HST rebate is additional if you won't live there, but there are mechanisms to get it back. And one final thing is, if the in an assignment, 
the builder will always charge the 24,000 HST rebate, whether the new person's living there or not. So whether the assignee, the buyer is living there or not, they're going to charge the 24,000 exactly. period. So and to that, clarify, yeah. that's the HST portion that is built into the purchase price. You got it. Okay, so if you're the assignor, you're selling your contract, you that doesn't involve you. You're not paying that. You don't have to worry about that. Correct. But Perfect. the new purchaser, so if you're an assignee and you're looking to buy one, this is for you. Yes. You will be assumed you're an investor and you'll be responsible for proving you're either a landlord with a one-year lease to get the rebate or you're going to move in there or your kids. Exactly. So if you move in there and it's your primary place of residence, so you're the end user or a blood relative, there is a rebate for you as well. We And a rebate can be done to get you back the 24000 So long story short is, one way or another, if you pay the twenty four thousand, you will get it back as long as you're li someone's living there or in a tenant or you. So it's it's not that bad at all. People get scared of the twenty four thousand. From a marketability perspective, I would say it's 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 if you're if you're a seller by assignment, it's better to do so very close to occupancy, but before occupancy, because you're just going to expand the spectrum of people who are prepared to buy that assignment because. Right. Prior to occupancy, we can still try to get that rebate for you uh, from the builder. But after occupancy, it's not going to happen at all. Like you will have to put that cash up front. Uh, so cash out for six to eight to 12 weeks, depending on how long it takes the CRA to process your application and come back. Um, so from a marketability perspective, if you have a really good contract negotiated that somebody like Ryan negotiated in the first 10 days with great caps on development charges that are transferable, free assignment or, or a low cost assignment um, and those sorts of things, then it's best to do that before occupancy because once you go into occupancy, uh, your audience, I feel like, becomes a little bit um, smaller. Your market becomes smaller because now suddenly that person needs to have that cash um, because 100% they will pay the HST rebate to the builder on closing. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and so they'll need that cash to, to just hold them down for a little while. So sell it before occupancy. Yeah. For okay. many, I think many reasons. You know, you don't want to pay the occupancy fee. Less complicated. Hey, um, I don't know if you wanted me to talk about when the deposits get released during this. Uh, because what happens we'll is... We'll leave that for some of the questions. No, no, no. Not, like I've got a whole bunch of questions around okay. that. So, Let's jump into to Peter. Okay. Um, like I got so many questions, it's gonna be nuts. I, I, and I don't wanna keep all you guys here like all day. It's so beautiful though, so. Okay, Th thank you, David, thanks. You give us a lot of information. And I, now that most people know, or everybody knows what assignment is, I'm going to look at the tax strategy on assignment sales and, uh, and the pre-construction properties. Next. Okay, so we're going to be discussing uh, an, a case study that I, I just received an email from a client which, which covered all the information that actually I was uh, planning to, uh, to, to bring here in a webinar. Uh, later on, we're going to uh, look at how CRA is going to be uh, as, uh, reviewing uh, the assignment sales. What's the complication when it comes to HST, when it comes to assignment sales? and uh, the type of income this is going to be a business income or is it going to be investment income and just before the end we are going to uh look at what happens if you decide to keep the property and you sell it after uh you rent it or after you live in it okay next okay so about two days ago a client uh, sent me an email and uh, he, he, uh, he just asked exactly what I was planning to, uh, you know, to um, to show in the webinar. So I decided to use it as a case study in our uh, example over here. So what he's saying, he's saying, I'm considering purchasing a pre-sale pre condo, completing the year 2025 to live in in my as a primary res primary residence. Uh, I have two questions. If I do not end up mo uh, moving in as originally planned, will CRA tax the condo as business income? Or if I end up selling after completion, will I be incur capital gain? 
Okay, so this is our main discussion uh, topic on, in the webinar here. The second question was talking about more in the principal resident, and he's asking, my current primary resident was purchased in the year 2018. I have lived here since. If I move out in 2025 and convert this to a rental property, um, how will CRA tax uh, uh, this unit? Oh, oh how, how will I be taxed uh, when I sell this unit? Next. Okay, so um, let's see how CRA is going to view the type of income when it comes to assignment. Is it going to be a business income or investment income? So CRA uh, is going to review, watch it. I mean, in most cases, let's look at it this way. In most cases, they will consider right away your business as a business income. It's a flip, and therefore, uh, you, ha you have the intention or you have the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the motivation to sell this property for a purpose of making a profit right away meaning business, a CRA is going to view it as a business income. It, it's not always the case, but in most cases it is. Okay, they're going to be looking at the, the, the intention. What was the original intention? Why did you purchase this property? Then they're going to be looking at what's the reason you sold the property? What is the behavior? How often do you buy and sell property? How much knowledge do you have on the real estate market? Uh, uh, how did you finance this, uh, this purchase? And obviously, they are going also to look at uh, type of properties. There are going to be some other uh, uh, categories, I mean, criteria, but, but they are not going to, to list all of them. Okay, so our scenario is like this. Uh, let's assume the taxpayer purchased the property in the year 2021 for $600,000. That's all on the paper. So they sign with the builder for $600,000. As David mentioned, most of the time you're going to have to pay 20% down payment. Or that's a 20% deposit. Uh, let, let's assume in the year 2025, uh, the market value of the property turned to be $900,000. So you decided to sell the property for $850,000, and therefore you have a profit of $250,000. $250,000, that's what you have in mind. However, you have to consider what are the expenses related to that, including the taxation. So let's look at the tax. So assuming, let's next, assuming, uh, uh, assuming say, you could not convince CRA that your intention was actually to live in there and they consider this as a business income. If it's a business income, What's going to happen, CRA view, view you as, as soon as you, you are selling it as an assignment, they view you as a builder. And therefore, they will charge you HST on a deposit plus the profit. So be aware of this. You are going to be paying tax on the deposit plus the profit. Okay, so in our situation, 20% of 600,000 is 120. Uh, and uh, you, you have to, I mean, then you pay tax HST on that part and uh, HST on the 250. Now, pay attention. I mean, if you do the calculation, it's not 13%, mainly because in our office, we often look at the, 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 uh, the cheapest way for you to pay the taxes. In our situation over here, we are using the quick method of HST. So on a quick method of HST, you're paying much less taxes than 13% that the CRA, you have to be qualified for this. Uh, but, but you know, if you get to this situation, I suggest, you know, uh, talk with the accounting about the option of HST quick method. Okay. That, that, that's why you're my accountant. I didn't even know about that. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Okay, let's go. Okay. So let's see what's happened when it comes to the income tax and uh, the bottom line of how much you are going to be keeping. So, Two options. One of them is if you close and you close it under your name as a, under the individual. So what's going to happen? You're going to be paying thirty-two thousand dollars in tax in HST, as we mentioned before, plus ninety-eight percent in taxes if your tax bracket is around the forty-five thousand dollars. So 
Ending up with 100, the bottom line, 120,000. From $250,000, you go down to $120,000. So then what I saw, what we suggest over here, if you have the option, next slide. So, so just to be clear, that example was, okay, so personal. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. personal, exactly. So this is a personal. You this, this, is, this is important stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so what happened, you have to remember, if you have the option to close it as a corporation, which means having a corporation closing the deal, then you are going to be paying huge amount of money less than what you've paid in, in the under the personal income, under the personal. So let's look at it again. For a corporation, we are paying 12.2% in taxes. It's a flat rate. You are going to pay the HST. You are going to pay the income tax. The income tax is only 90, uh, 26,000 compared to 98 as individual. You end up with $192,000, which is not too bad when it comes to you know profit of 250. You end up with 192. There is another uh, benefit. Have, uh, okay, let's go a to the next. Difference. Huge difference. Yeah. yeah, it's a huge difference. So let's look at a different scenario. Let's look at the scenario where your intention it was, for example, your intention, the original intention was to live in the property and for whatever reason, you could not close it because let's say you, uh, let's assume you uh, got a job in a different city and you could not close it. So in that situation, CRA might, will consider this as investment income and investment income taxed at a different rate. So, numbers, so the same situation, purchase price $600,000, selling uh, assignment is eight hundred and fifty. dollars you have a profit of $250,000, that's considered capital gain. Next. So on a capital gain, the taxes are taxed differently. So first of all, there is no HST on that. So you, right away, you're saving the HST part. Next, you're going to be paying $56,000 instead of the 90 something thousand dollars over the other side. So you end up with $194,000 net after taxes. What happened with the corporation? So the corporation paying a bit less taxes, uh, sorry, a little, a little bit more taxes uh, in a corporation. It's a little bit, it's considered to be passive income and you're paying a bit less, uh, uh, more taxes. So you're paying 63,000, you end up with 187,000. However, Next slide. There is some benefit that the corporation have on, on individual. What's happened is every time you have a capital gain inside the corporation, 50% of the gain you can pull out from the corporation tax-free, meaning you are entitled to 50% of the gain. So if you have $250,000 gain, you allowed to take $125,000 from the corporation to your personal bank account and you pay no tax on it. In addition to that, if you decided uh, to take a dividend, it doesn't have to be immediately. You can take a dividend at any time in the future. It doesn't have to be immediately. Then once you take the dividend, CRL will refund you an approximately of $38,000 back. You refund to the corporation. So overall, more, more benefit having a corporation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's, that's huge. That's a significant difference. And, yeah. you know, a, a lot of people, that's why it's so important in the very beginning, you know, with your realtor, with your lawyer, um, you know, when you buy pre-construction, you want to add a corporation. Um, you majority of the time you have to have an individual on the contract alongside the corporation. Um, that's just the, the developers, lenders, banks want to see an, an actual person on it. Um, but, you know, there's things you can do. I sort of take it away from you, Peter, but I think this is really important. Yeah, sure. I get these questions all the time, and I know David does. It's really important to, um, you know, structure the deal in a way that's going to allow you to, um, you know, first of all, this is actually really important if you're going to close on it to direct title to the corporation. But, Peter, you can answer this. If I'm going to assign my unit and never close on it, but my corporation is not actually on the original agreement of purchase and sale. How is the CRA going to view that as a, even if the funds are coming from my corporation, the corporation probably has to be on the agreement, right? Yes, exactly. So a corporation has to be on the agreement. And the listing agreement. Yeah. Yeah. So let me just say this as an additional thing. If, if everyone's here who's listening is thinking of doing this, it doesn't cost a lot to create a corporation. So create one, Do it now. have one ready in your back pocket 
because when it's time to buy and you got your 10 days, you don't want to be creating a corporation then. And I will ask, we always ask to yeah. add a corporation later, but this is more important to add a corporation now, not later. So get a corporation. It's no big deal. Have one. And then you can add it on right away when you're buying. So it's like John Smith plus corporation name is the name on the agreement. And that way, when you sell it by assignment, then what, Peter? What if, Peter, what if there's the name of John Smith plus the corporation? Because that is 95% of the time. That's yeah. what you really see at the time of assignment. So can you speak to that? Yeah. Yeah. So so the way I look at it, I mean, it's a corporation who closed the deal. And, and therefore, if the corporation closed the deal, uh, it is considered to be a business in income. It's a, an active business income, and therefore the tax at a 12.2%. Okay? So you're paying much less income tax. Okay? Right. Yeah. Um, and then just to go back to that point, um, so a lot of my clients ask me, like, can I add a corporation later? I say it's always best to do it within the 10 days because, you know, things change. Developers will maybe allow it by amendment later. Maybe it's by assignment. Um, but if you're thinking about um, assigning, um, you know, you want to have that corporation on the contract because uh, someone just asked a question, can I assign it to my corporation and then assign it again to an individual? Um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Often developers only allow one assignment. Um, and, you know, I think there's probably tax implications to doing it that way anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's look at the next uh... Okay, so this is the next uh, different scenario. This is a different uh, situation. Uh, this is a resale. This is not an assignment, meaning uh, you close on the deal, uh, you, re you got the property, and you decide, let's say, to rent the property. If you do that, obviously, as uh, David mentioned before, you are entitled to, re if, you, if you rent it for at least one year, uh, you are entitled to the $24,000. Uh, you keep the corporation. So let's say you op you purchase it in a, for six hundred thousand dollars in two thousand and twenty one. In the year two thousand and twenty six, the value went up, goes to a million dollars, and you sell it for a million dollars. A capital gain you 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 uh, incur capital gain of four hundred thousand dollars. Next, so what happened in this situation? Uh, if it is under your personal, you are going to be paying ninety thousand dollars and four hundred thousand. Uh, which left you with $310,000 in a corporation. Next slide. In a corporation, you are going to pay, pay again a little bit more income tax on the corporation side because it's a passive income. So you end up with $300,000 uh, net profit. However, again, uh, next slide. You, since you have a capital gain, um, you are entitled to the 50% of the gain tax-free. So you can pull out $200,000 from the corporation uh, to your personal account. And in the future, you can also receive a refund, a dividend tax refund of around $61,000. Okay. Okay. Over here, I think uh, the best thing is if you just, there's a lot of numbers, so you better just take a picture or you can, uh, in a few, I mean, later on, you can uh, log out, log to the, our website. We'll You'll send, find we'll send this. a recording. We'll send a recording. As yeah, well. send this one too. Yeah. So you don't need to write it down. Okay, next. Okay, so la last thing I wanted to answer the, the client for the second question that he, he, that he asked. And the second question was, again, uh, my current primary resident was purchased in the year 2018. I have lived here since. If I moved out in 2028 and converted to a rental property, how will, how will CRA tax me on that, on that once I sell it? Okay, next. Okay, so the answer for that is simple. For the, uh, the, the, uh, the increase in value between the 2018 to the 2028, uh, 25, it's going to be exempt under the principal uh, resident rule. And uh, anything, any addition value between the year 2025 up to the day of sellings, that's going to be considered capital gain. However, uh, pay attention to this one. This is very important. When you change, when there is a change of use of a property, you can extend the principal resident by four years more. I mean, you can actually 
uh, extend the principal re uh, resident uh, exemption up to the another four years. In order you to do that, you have to elect to do that. And um, you actually need to remember there's going to be only one principal resident uh, each time. So you can, let's assume you sold it in the year 2028. Uh, and, uh, and um, you move to it in the year 2025, you still, if you elected proper, you're still not paying any taxes on the, on the profit. Okay, that's all I have. Uh, now, <laughs> just questions if you guys have. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Um, Thanks. Thank you, Peter. No um, problem. Let me just figure out how to, Oh, there we go. Um, so, yeah, I mean, guys, this is uh, Peter and, 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 and David. Thank you. Uh, I've been working with you guys for years and I, I keep telling people this, that it's, it's just, you know, it's so important to work with a really good team. Uh, I think it's important to, to, you know, real estate should be simple and a lot of people overcomplicate it. It really isn't rocket science. Um, but, you know, I understand these are big numbers and, and it's very new to a lot of people. So I think it's just really important to work with experts who have really achieved the success that you want to achieve. And, um, you know, I don't want to throw other agents or, or professionals under the bus, but, you know, I think it's important to, to ask questions. Is if you know you want to own five investment properties, 10 investment properties, ask the people you're dealing with, do you own five investment properties? how do i do it i want to do it the way you did it and um you know there's many people like like that me that are doing it so i'm not saying i'm the only one but there's a lot of people that just you know don't know how to do it so very important to ask the right questions very important to work with a team of experts um don't reinvent the wheel and real estate really is simple um you know with the right, right goal and taking the right plan of action and um i think with that we'll just head into the q a we um we we are just around an hour, um, but we're recording it. So if you guys want to take off, um, no worries. You can take off and we'll send you guys a recording tomorrow. Uh, actually, go back. There's some key takeaways. Uh, thank you, Steph. Uh, Pre-construction condos offer the ultimate leverage. So we went right into that at the beginning. Um, you know, you're buying uh, a highly appreciating piece of paper that's actually appreciating, outperforming the rest of the market. Uh, you don't require a mortgage. And you, you know, you want to make sure that your contract allows you to assign. So you're taking it to a lawyer. You're making sure it has all of those things you understand when you can assign. Um, and you know, like we just discussed, I think it's important to add a corporation if you're planning on assigning. Um, something we will always point out to you, and, and we discuss with our clients. Uh, so does David and Sonia. Um, you know, invest within a corp. So the tax purposes. So you want to. Uh, those examples were amazing, Peter. Thank you. Um, but the savings are significant. And, um, you know, if you're wanting to build wealth, whether you're buying and holding real estate or flipping, uh, a corporation is going to allow you to accumulate more wealth uh, within it. Um, and then work with the right team of experts. So you've got a, a, we've got a great team here. Um, and then we'll jump into Q&A. And, and at the Q&A slide, we've just got all of our contact info. If you guys have any questions uh, for me, uh, my information's there, connect at connect.ca Realty. Uh, my team will get back to you. And then David and Peter's information is there as well. So we'd love to hear from you. If we don't get to your answer uh, to, to your questions on, on the session, uh, feel free to contact us. Um, okay, so I wrote down some of the more common ones. So how far out do people usually assign? And I know Sonia kind of touched on this. So like, are, are people assigning close to occupancy? Is it like years in advance? When, when do you see is the most common? So typically I see people signing close to occupancy. Uh, the reason being that you want to realize the greatest increase in value uh, over time without having to incur any uh, s sacrifice, let's call it that. And that means an additional deposit that's usually due on occupancy, and it means occupancy fees. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it also means actually assuming occupancy and responsibility for the unit, um, which then, as I said before, it decreases your market. So typically, I see people assigning, I'm going to say, you know, 60 to 90 to 120 days before occupancy. Uh, so that whoever they are assigning to, the process can be completed before occupancy, and then that new person can take occupancy. 
yeah, and yeah. to that point, if you're selling something 60 to 90 days out, like as a realtor advertising these properties, it's important to get that listed long in advance. Earlier. Yeah, earlier, because we're not putting them on MLS. Um, they've got to be out there. Once, you know, the building's close to completion, that's usually when people that saw your listing four or five months ago usually come back and see that it's still there. Um, and that's usually how, how we're successful with selling them. Um, coming in 60 to 90 days before occupancy are um they they've been listed for quite some time they're, yeah, they're yeah. pretty much firm deals and they're ready to go yeah yeah um and then how yeah. the deposit and profit portion of the deal paid out maybe walk us through how you know that that kind of process works um and then how it's paid out so that process works however you want it to work. <laughs> I, guess, I guess it kind of starts with me because it comes down to negotiations, right? Like we often, if I'm representing the assignor, we want my client to get all his money out as quickly as possible. Uh, I'm representing the assignee. I want to pay it, you know, once he gets a mortgage and it's easier. So yeah, I guess it really depends. Exactly. And that's, that's the freedom to contract in assignments. So you can decide what dates you're going to use as, um, as sort of your payment dates. Uh, so whether it's on uh, builder consent or whether it's on occupancy or whether it's on final closing, it really depends on the buyer and what their cash flow is like, because some of them just can't afford to pay the deposit prior to getting their mortgage until unit transfer. Um, uh, so it's really a negotiating thing between you and uh, and the other agent on on what their client is able to do. And in the good cases these days, I am seeing assignments completed at the uh, consent stage. To be honest, and that's because right now it's a seller's market. Even in terms of assignments, um, people like brand new, fresh units that nobody has lived in that they don't have to wait three years to get into. So. Um, at this stage, it's still, I am seeing personally from my clients that they're still feeling that it's a, a seller's market for assignments. Um, and they're feeling that the profit needs to be paid right at the time of consent. Yeah. Um, and assignors uh, or investors, like, like many of your clients, are not prepared to wait until unit transfer. If, if they're going to wait till unit transfer, then they might as well just wait to assign it. Yeah, and it's sometimes it's sometimes a good opportunity for investors as well. Like we've been talking about buying and being the assignor, but if you're the assignee and you have cash, there's good deals to be picked up. It's not as good as everyone thinks. I get a phone call every week from someone who's a shark who's looking to buy something for pennies on the dollar. It's not like that anymore. It was many, many years ago, but you can buy something twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars below market value, um, you know, which which works really well for end users, obviously, instead of you know buying something on the resale market and competing with multiple offers. Um, so if you do have cash, often investors just want to get their money out very quickly. Um, so if you come in and give them all their profit and and, and deposits, uh, typically they'll reduce the price and negotiate the price. Um, okay, so I had a tax question for you here. Which part of flipping makes the corporation an active business? I understand that rental income is considered passive and the tax implications are a lot greater. You're right. Uh, a rental income is considered to be passive. However, we have to remember if it's a short rental income such as uh, Airbnb, uh, that's considered to be a business income. So pay attention, uh, short term recreation, those kind of uh, rentals are, are considered uh, business income. And in those, those one we re usually recommend to open a corporation and do the transaction uh, on, on, the, on the corporation, not as a, yeah. Great, thank you. One thing about short term rentals, don't do them if you can in the very first year. So in the very first year of buying new construction, you really want to do only one of two things, either live in there as your primary place of residence or rent it out for one year minimum or assign it. That's how I started and that's how I'm ending. Yeah. You, you got to do one of those two things because if you don't and you do a short term rental as your first person that moves into the property, it is going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to retrieve the twenty four thousand dollars. And that's a lot of money. Exactly. You, you will not be able to get the twenty four thousand dollars for short term rental. Yeah, I, I have some units that I've furnished and usually what I do is I do the one year lease um, yeah. and then I increase rents and either the tenant stays and uh, pays 
good rents or they leave and I furnish it if it's, you know, has that opportunity after the first year. Um, should we have personal legal name or personal corporation name? Um, yeah, Peter, I'd like to hear from your perspective. Does that matter at all? If it's not at all, not at all. You, holding company or operating company, does it matter? Does not matter at all. You can have it under a numbered company. You can have it under uh, whatever name you prefer, but it makes no difference. What I can say is it does from a, a financing um, point of view. So a lot of banks don't want to lend to operating companies. They want to lend to uh, holding companies. And the best way to set up a corp is to have a numbered provincial corp. Um, that way they don't ask questions and it just usually goes smoother versus, versus having, you know, Ryan Coyle's real estate business corp. You know, so it's, it's, it's better just to do a numbered corp. Um, and then another question, which I think is good, um, and, and, and I'm, I'm curious as well, because um, I think there's some you know nuances to it. But if should you have uh, one corporation per property, and if not, what like is the maximum amount of properties you should have in one corp? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, you some some people some people uh, that I know they have uh, a corporation for each property that they have, and the 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 reason for that is when they decided to sell uh, the unit they sell the corporation so if you sell the corporation they're saving on you know a land transfer ta land transfer tax i guess so you only as i mean you sell the share of the corporation uh, and but uh, in a normal situation i mean it's going to be costly if you open a corporation for every unit so obviously you have to keep uh, you know to open a corporation pay the accounting and the corporation tax for this so i would probably say i mean the reason for a, a corporation, uh, one of the reasons of a corporation is to look into the uh, ability to get mortgage, easy mortgage. Uh, so I would say three, four mortgages, and then after that, say, the bank is going to come again and say, oh, it's going to be difficult to uh, get you a mortgage. So therefore, in that, in that case, open another corporation. Yeah, and I'll add to that as well because you know we're talking a lot, obviously, about corporations. And and me as an investor, the, the probably the most important thing I've done to have as many mortgages and properties as I have is by buying through holding corps. Um, and the reason being is uh, often banks ask what Ryan Coyle, uh, what properties Ryan Coyle owns, and they don't want to know about my businesses or holding corps. Um, so when I go get a new mortgage they will run my personal credit report. And often you're not, even though you're a guarantor when your, your, your corporation gets a mortgage, um, you don't, it doesn't, most of the time, in my experience, it doesn't show up on your personal credit report. So it allows your borrowing, it, it increases your borrowing ability uh, often by doing it that way as well. Did you just put up your hand, David? <laughs> you're on mute, but I have a feeling you're on TikTok or something. TikTok and Instagram, this thing has people. <laughs> Um, well, here, I've got a question for you, Sonia, and, and I know you kind of touched on this. I think we're leaving it for the end. So what happens if you can't come up with the funds to close? Um, so I guess maybe we should rephrase that. Yeah, I mean, I guess. In, ter in terms of the rebate or in terms of just generally? I think what they're asking is if, if they bought and they're about to assign and, um, you know, they're, 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 they're purpose was to assign it and then all of a sudden they weren't successful i mean what kind of happens at that point you have to close with the builder or they will forfeit your deposit if you do not um once you close with the builder if you decide to sell it immediately if this is in reply to janice's question then you will forever lose the rebate unless you put a tenant in there on a one-year lease and then you can apply to get the rebate back on the basis that it's a, a residential um, rental property. And I, I'll have, Peter, if you have anything to add to that, I don't know, uh, but that's from my perspective, the legal side. Yeah, no, I don't have anything to add to that. Violet? No. It's um, if corporation is added to the purchasers, how can the person get a mortgage? And I kind of touched on that. Um, if you are closing or buying an assignment or just whatever, closing under a holding corp, um, the bank is going to look at you personally and you're going to be a guarantor. Uh, the important point question that I just brought up is, is the bank going to put it on your personal credit report or leave it off? And that 
kind of dictates what your, your borrowing ability ends up being. Um, and there's some banks that just don't put it on personally. So we can, you know, go through all that with you later. Um, Ryan, when buying pre-construction condos, which do you focus on for price range, low price, high price, mid range? Um, you know, it, it really depends where it's located. Um, you know, I'll give you actually a really good example. I bought uh, where I live currently, I bought a one bedroom and a three bedroom. And the one bedroom at the time, um, you, you guys closed this one for me, uh, Sonny. This was, this was a bit of a headache, but this was Lighthouse Tower, uh, my assignment. We, we had a few headaches in there. Like you mentioned earlier, there's sometimes challenges with these, but they always end up closing. Um, so I, I, put, I bought a 5% down deal. Purchase price list, I think it was just like 350. So whatever, it was like $12,500 I put down on this deal. And I sold it uh, just over five years later at a profit of, I think it was about 180,000. Um, so, I mean, the return on that, you know, is, is significant. I think it was like four or 500%. Um, and then I had a three bedroom condo that I put a 5% deposit on as well. So that was like a million and a half dollars. Um, and, you know, it only ended up being, I put down 12,500 here. I put down on this one about 65,000. So a difference of about 50,000. But the amount of money I ended up moving the three bedroom, I thought about selling it, thought, thought about assigning it because it had gone up about eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars. So, you know, I went from or seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars. I went from making a very good return on a on a one bedroom, um, but I could have invested, you know, with an extra fifty grand, I would have made an extra probably three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars. So, um, you know, there's nuances to that. It depends on the location, depends on the building, depends on the structure but you know typically returns are very similar but if you're buying more expensive property you're gonna put more money in your pocket um, most builders require approval on pre-sale most of them want a mortgage pre-approval letter what are you guys finding right now yeah that's they, they, yeah, they, so they're pretty they're pretty easy to get like they're, honestly they're, they're not a mortgage approval um, so. actually these days Ryan it's more than a mortgage pre-approval that they're asking for from assignees they're asking for a mortgage approval right that's a good point so I was thinking from buying at the beginning or commitment yeah, yeah 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 so that's that's a good point so what happens when the assignee comes in and buys the deal they obviously need to be qualified and be able to get a mortgage. Yes. Very qualified. Not pre-approval anyway. pre qualified, but approval approval qualified um, <laughs> or commitment qualified. Like we're, we're going beyond the pre-approval stage now. Right. This is a good question. So do all of the incentives uh, that you negotiate uh, with the assignor, you know, five years ago, get transferred to the assignee, the new purchaser? That's and, a very good Oh, sorry. And, go ahead. And then there, this is my question because <laughs> yeah. I want to know the answer to it because yeah. uh, I, I've seen kind of go both ways. Um, and then in addition to that, um, or included, I guess, in that, if, if the building is delayed and the unit has the right to a delayed occupancy fee, which can be up to $7,500, um, can is the new purchaser, does that transfer with the contract, I guess? Okay. So this is the topic of transferability. Uh, and a good lawyer in the first 10 days will talk to the client about transferability, especially if they're thinking of assigning. So one thing I do is I get on the call with the client and I said, I say, what are you doing? You're going to live here. You're going to sign. They say, I'm going to sign. Okay. So are these transferable? And we in the 10 day cooling off period analyze every agreement separately. Some are transferable and some are not. But the ones that are not, we ask for, we request for transferability from the builder. And then we report to the client if we got it or not. In many cases we get it, which is great. And what that means is, Yes, if you if your development charges were capped at ten thousand instead of twenty, then you get to pass that ten thousand on to the assignee, therefore making your agreement more valuable. And that's what you're selling, right? Because you're not selling a property; you're selling an agreement. So you want to make that agreement more valuable, and that's how by getting transferability. And then on to Tyrion. Yes, if you assign the contract to someone else, the Tyrion warranty, uh, as long as they register with Tyrion, it continues on with them, and they can go on with that, unless the builder throws something in there. Like, I don't want to, there's sometimes, that's later on, but sometimes a builder, if you ask for certain, uh, like a delay, let's say you have to delay by a few days or a week, they may remove the Terry on compensation for you for delay, but that's another topic for another day. When it comes to assignments, yes, the Terry on gets transferred as long as the new purchaser uh, registers with Terry on. So the right. warranty is transferred. 
Um, can I, th like this is an important one we already talked about, but can I add my corporation after the 10 day cooling off period is over or does it depend on the builder? Yes, it, it really depends on the builder. It depends on what part they're in. Sometimes it's all done internally with their, the builders admin, and then it gets, you know, handed over to their lawyers admin at some point. And then typically if lawyers involved, there's, you know, fees and more complications. So, um, you know, I, I just can't stress it enough, guys. If, you, if you're thinking about assigning, if you're thinking about closing under court, just get it done within the 10 days. So easy to set up. David can yeah. help you. People can help you. We can help you. Yeah. Uh, very easy thing to do. So that's number one. And number two, we always, as part of our practice, and I showed that at the beginning, we always request to the builder to be able to add a corporation at a later date. Whether the client asks us for that or not, we yeah. ask because ask and ye shall receive. We want to make sure that our clients have options, and that's what we try and do. And and but do they? What are they saying these days? Are they yeah, allowing? So they're saying, they're always, yeah. days. So they're like, saying quite often they're saying yes, you can add a corporation at a later date. That won't help so much for assignment, as sure. Peter, but it will help. The that's the the thing. They don't say when the date is, and if you want to assign it, then you might be you know. Screwed. The problem is that they'll say at the time of assignment, okay, you can assignment, but. We are taking out the cap on development charges. We right. are taking out the transferability of this. We wow. are taking out this. We are charging you X dollars. Wow. And uh, so that's the problem, right? They, they have this, this consent that they can hang their hat on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So even if your uh, uh, caps are transferable, let's say it's negotiated, they'll say, okay, fine, but we're only going to consent if they don't transfer. So that's why yeah, it's really important yeah. in that first day, 10 days to also get the right to consent, the full right, uh, sorry, the right to assign, the full right to assign, not just the standard form builder agreement, which says we'll give you the right to assign uh, on consent. And what percentage of builders would you say are allowing that wording? Uh, I'm going to say most. Most. Oh. Um. This is a great question because I, I don't actually know the answer to it. I think I do, but uh, do the same legal implications apply to a single family home brought, bought pre-construction as to a condo? Houses and condos, same. Okay. However, I want to say <laughs> the cost to assign houses is usually higher. It's not legal implications, but we, we find that the price to assign a house is not usually zero to, to 2,000 and sometimes it's 2,000 to 5,000 to 10,000 to sometimes I've even seen 25,000. So yeah. You, yeah. if you're seriously buying a house for the purpose to assign it and I've done that myself a few times and I love it, just make sure during the 10 day cooling off period that you know what the assignment rights are. Okay, And then I'll, just to drive this home one last time, I think one of the key take home messages from all this is if you're thinking of doing an assignment, go get a corporation, it's cheap, even now, have it in your back pocket so when you when the opportunity comes to buy a property, you won't be scrambling to create a corporation. You'll have one, you put it down on the agreement of purchase and sale, and it's easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Yeah, um, and the one important thing, and I, I can't believe I didn't bring this up earlier, the, the reason why assignments work so well, and especially pre-construction condos specifically, is um, you know it's the appreciation um, that really gives you your profit, your returns. And um, a lot of people just assume they can go buy a low rise house and make a ton of money, assign it. I've seen a lot of people get burned doing that because it's ready in a year. It's ready in a year and a half. It doesn't give you the luxury of time, uh, time and leverage, which I think is the, 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 the two most important things for doing a very successful assignment. Um, you know, look for a 10, 15% down deposit uh, on a condo, uh, put it in your filing cabinet for four or five years, you know, close on the first one, you'll have, you know, a ton of equity to go do that two, three more times and you just kind of build it that way. It's, it's kind of a, a slow and, and, and boring way of doing it, it's, uh, but it's like, you know, very lucrative and, and, and safe way of doing it. Um, anything, uh, we're going to get off because I know everyone wants to enjoy their day and, um, can I answer one question? Yeah. Um, Billy asked if, if, if you can make the application for the HST rebate right away or if you have to wait the year um, until the lease ends. Um, so just to answer your question, uh, Billy, you can that application can be made immediately after closing. Um, so you close with the builder, you pay the, the 24000 or whatever that amount is, 
and immediately right afterwards, uh, you can make the application to the CRA to get that money back as long as you submit the application with a copy of your one-year lease uh, by the tenant to use it as their primary residence and, and yada yada. So you don't have to wait the year for the completion of the lease to apply for that rebate. And typically it takes 12 weeks or so um, uh, for the money to come in, but that fluctuates depending on CRA volume at the time. And we do that as part of our process. So we ask, are you leasing it out? If yes, we ask you for the lease and we pretty much do the paperwork and apply for it like the day you get your deed or a few days later uh, because we want to get you the money as soon as possible. Awesome. Well, we, we, find, we find quite often that people are not aware of this uh, uh, rebate and yeah. they don't apply for it. So they have two years. After the two years is over, it's too late to apply. Exactly. A few years ago, um, that, like I think there's a, an article on the Globe and Mail or something, but the amount of money that was unclaimed was just mind blowing. Does do, do either of you recall that or know what that is? Definitely. And I get calls all the time as well. Uh, people call me up. They say, "You do HST rebates?" And I say, "Yeah." They say, "Oh, I closed a year ago and I didn't know anything about it." And we literally just do rebates all day for people. Unbelievable. Yeah, crazy. Well, guys, thank you so much. That was a lot of fun. It was, uh, you know, good doing a presentation with you about having a great conversation. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining. We'll be sending out the recorded uh, copy soon. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Yeah, bye. Take care.